gracias por venir. Ahora voy a seguir en inglés, pero no me quería privar de, de las buenas tardes en, en español. Uh, it is my great pleasure to, to introduce you to you, uh, Professor Hans Linsburg. Um, he is the director of the Center of Human Rights at the University of Pretoria, uh, where he teaches in human rights from 1991, and where he is the director of the Master in Human Rights and Democratization. Uh, Professor Bilder has an LLOB of the University of Pretoria, and um, has a bachelor and master in Africans of the same university. He is a magister in international law from the University of Cambridge, and a PhD in law in the University of Pretoria. He has been teaching in many universities all over the world, University of Oxford, Essex, our academy, the Inter-European Institute, the University of Zimbabwe, the University of Addis Ababa, among others. And um, he has a good experience in the field too, you know that. Theory is not enough in order to deal with human rights, and uh, he has been working in the field for the ILO, Open Society Initiative, the UNDP, the Office of the High Commissioner in Human Rights, and he has also uh, been a member of the UN Intergovernmental Working Group of the CERD, the Committee of the Elimination of Russian Discrimination, on the Effective Implementation of the Durban Declaration and Program of Action. Uh, he has published a lot, he has written a lot, and uh, I do have to thank here our friends, uh, Jorge Italiana and Veronica Gomez from the INSAM, uh, because in fact, they have been the first to, to uh, welcome the Pavilion, and uh, with great generosity, they decided that, uh, to come here with them. I must tell you that around this table, and on the sides, you do have very qualified people, people who has participated in, in moot courts dealing with human rights, people who has uh, participated in exchange programs, mainly specialized with human rights, and you also have some of the people dealing with human rights issues in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I don't want to identify anybody, the moment will come for each of you to identify yourself, but you have to know that you have people with a good experience all over the all around the table. And that means that uh, they will be in a position to uh, enjoy uh, this uh, lecture. I want again to thank you very much for being with us. For me personally, it's a great pleasure and a great honor. I've been telling Professor Gildren of the decision, the political decision of this law school of public human rights as a mandatory subject, mandatory course uh, from the restoration of democracy. So, we are deeply honored of having you here. You have a pleasure. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction, and um, thank you very much for your attendance here. May I just say that I'm really very pleased to be here at the University of Buenos Aires. Um, it so happens that the University of Pretoria, where I'm from, also has a formal collaboration with this university. We obviously have a, perhaps a more tight relationship with the University of San Martin, because of the particular master's program in which we collaborate. Um, they is here in Latin America and we in Pretoria, we run a master's program that brings together 30 students from all around the African continent. And we work in collaboration with 12 partner institutions, universities in Africa, to which our students um, go for part of their studies. And, and we are supported by the European Union, amongst others, as they are here in San Martin. But I think my dean, Professor Buran, in particular, will be very happy. He told me to take up links, and before I could actually do that, it was already done for me. So I was very happy that this all fell in place. Um, so my um, gratitude is also because I see this as a solidification, not only of the university relationships, but really one between the continents um, in the framework of our South-South efforts of exploring the intellectual linkages and the ways in which we in the South would um, also enrich the thinking um, of ourselves and, and, and of the rest of the world. 
Um, it's also gratifying, lastly, because I know that the University of Buenos Aires has participated in the World Mood Court Competition, the Human Rights Mood Court Competition, that takes place every year on 10 December on International Human Rights Law Day. And um, I hope that we will see um, the representatives there again this year. So with these um, few words of, um, of thanks, I would um, like to just briefly explain how I think um, I would like to structure my few remarks. I would briefly, for the benefit of those who are not so familiar with the African human rights system, give a brief overview of its salient characteristics. But I will then focus on the challenges um, and the new developments. And I will conclude by also just uh, drawing some comparisons um, from the um, inter-American system in particular. When one looks at the African system of human rights protection, the system that has evolved yeah. under the auspices of the OAU, the Organization of African Unity, which was founded in 1963, um, one needs to keep in mind that this is the most recent of the three major regional systems. So I don't say this in apology, I say this in uh, real realism, in the realization of the fact that the African system really essentially has come about in 1981, when the African Charter was adopted, in 1986, when it entered into force, and really in 1987, when the African Commission, the monitoring body of that um, system, had started operating. So, as it happens, I have a little booklet here, um, that obviously for those who are particularly interested, you may have one, it's also available um, online. Um, this says 30 years. So this is um, last year, actually, it's old news in a sense. This was 30 years of the African uh, Charter's adoption. But we are, keep, we are keeping on to celebrate in Africa because this year it is 25 years since the, end, the, the actual operation of the African Commission started. So um, I, I leave this here, but I do um, think that I can distribute these for those who do not have. I have some copies of the African Charter and the protocol on the rights of women um, that um, we also um, published together with the African Commission for this year of celebration. So if you didn't have a copy, maybe I'll make a, a little reference to that and you can take it as a token of your, your presence here. Too. So the African system is a two-tiered system, similar to the inter-American system. It consists of what I mentioned now already, the African Commission, and an African court. So in principle, it functions in the same way as the inter-American functions, system functions at the moment. If an individual wants to bring a complaint, he or she would go first to the African Commission, and thereafter, the Commission has standing to take the matter to the African court, and the court's decision will then be binding. Just as in the inter-American system, the Commission's findings are non-binding. Under international law, they are recommendatory, and for many years, up to 2006, it was only the Commission that existed. So the African Court, in our case, the African Court on Human and People's Rights, is quite a recent phenomenon, having um, really started operating only in the last five odd years. So reinforcing my point that the system is new, but in particular, the African Court is a very recent phenomenon that had been added to the system. In terms of the approach between the African Commission and the Court, let me just say that at the moment there are 53 state parties to the African Charter, and that is essentially all the African states, member states of the African Union, with the exception of two states. Um, one AU member state is not a party to the African Charter, and that is the recently internationally recognized state of South Sudan. So I suppose we can forgive them, they have more uh, important fish to fry at the moment. The other state which is not a party to the Charter, but also not a member of the African Union, is Morocco. So Morocco is really outside of the fold, although it's a member of the United Nations. In respect of all these states, individuals may approach the African Commission. However, to approach the African Court, the state concerned must obviously have accepted the jurisdiction of that court. 
And only 26 states, about half the states in Africa, have thus far accepted the jurisdiction of the court. In a way, then, the African system takes access a little bit further than the inter-American system because in the protocol, the legal instrument that establishes the African court, there is provision for direct access to the African court. But the direct access to the African court is dependent on a state making an optional declaration. So there's an optional declaration within the protocol that a state could make to allow individuals access directly to the court. In other words, similar to what is in place in the European system for human rights protection. So far, five states have made such a declaration, so not many, and I'm sad to say that South Africa is not one of those five that have made such a declaration. The five states, I think they should be celebrated in all corners of the world, so let me name their names. They are Tanzania, where the court is based, um, in Arusha, <coughs> Burkina Faso, perhaps because the protocol um, establishing the court was adopted in Ouagadougou, in Burkina Faso, maybe that's the reason. Another state is Mali, one of the countries that professes at least to be a democratic multi-party democracy, although it's been destabilized recently because of the um, military intervention in that country. Ghana, a country on the west coast of Africa that really is one of the most stable and progressive democracies of um, the last 10 years. And lastly, and most surprisingly, Malawi. No one really knows why we should add Malawi to that list. Be that as it may. In other words, it's a mixed bag. We have indirect and direct access to the court. And so far, let me, let me say immediately, the court has not heard a single case on the merits. It has only been dealing with matters uh, concerning procedure, inadmissibility, the lack of jurisdiction, etc. It has decided one case on a precautionary measure issue, and that was a case against Libya, Gaddafi's Libya, um, in March 2011, um, ordering the government of the time to refrain from uh, essentially um, uh, depriving the right to life of and body security of individuals and its um, control. As far as the norms in the African system are concerned, the main normative framework according to which rights may be vindicated is the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, similar to the American Convention. The African Charter is different from the American Convention in a number of ways, and I'll highlight just a few. Firstly, the African Charter, as its title indicates, is not only a right, a, a treaty um, protecting individual human rights, but also people's rights, collective rights. Um, and these collective rights have been understood, the people's rights have been understood to encompass the people in a territory, peoples of a country, state-centered approach to peoples, but also to, uh, to refer to minorities or sub-state units within states, linguistic, cultural, and other groupings for minorities within states. And we have um, a relatively uh, growing jurisprudence uh, in which uh, groups have asserted their rights. Particularly, indigenous peoples have benefited from this collective rights uh, paradigm. In Africa, one could say this is one of the great success stories of the African Commission, the supranational forum. While at the domestic level, no state in Africa has been prepared really to recognize even the existence of indigenous peoples, let alone provide for their rights guaranteed in constitutions and otherwise. The failure of the domestic legal system have inspired the NGOs, civil societies to regroup, as it were, and exploit the forum provided by the African Commission, the supranational. Perhaps working in a very good example with international NGOs, IFGIA, uh, International Work Group for Indigenous Affairs, for example, has been working, collaborating with NGOs, fledgling NGOs in Africa. They have obtained observer status as NGOs with the African Commission, and they started to uh, articulate their claims before the African Commission. The African Commission, in response, established a working group 
to investigate and ponder the question of indigenous people's rights in Africa. And eventually, in one of the most um, famous decisions of the African Commission now, the case against Kenya, the Commission unequivocally held that indigenous people's rights had been violated through the eviction from the place where they found themselves traditionally to um, a relocated area. Now, the reason for states' resistance, perhaps, is not so difficult to understand. African leaders would often argue that all Africans are indigenous. If indigeneity is defined as a concept that comes about due to colonial or foreign intrusion and conquest, then in that sense, clearly, all Africans would be entitled to the epitaph of indigenousness or indigeneity. But the African Commission then had to essentially engage with this concept, this issue, the claims of indigenous people, and had to rethink what indigeneity means in Africa. And to its credit, it has worked around the concept and has held that indigeneity does not depend on prior occupation, does not mean that you have had to be there before colonial conquest. You don't have to have, be a first people to qualify as indigenous, but indigeneity is linked to your close material and spiritual relationship with the land, for example, your um, distinctive cultural uh, modes of production, for example, and your self-identification as a group and the way that you are being received and granted the status through the identification of others. So, I may, as a little interposition, um, inter say that the African Commission did find it useful in this respect to refer back to the Inter-American Court jurisprudence on the same issue. I mentioned last night that in the case uh, concerning Suriname, the Salamanca case, for example, the idea that Afro-descendants would also be entitled to the benefits of indigenous peoples means that it is not the the classical idea of first peoples that necessarily define all that could accrue to indigenous people. So, I was saying that for the other, for marginalized groupings within the African continent, the case very well illustrated by indigenous peoples, the African Commission, the forum provided by the African Commission, provided an outlet, a, 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 a place where in the space where they could articulate their claims while it was impossible to do so at the domestic level. And that's the point, I suppose, of a regional system, that it adds something. It provides a forum, it provides uh, a kind of a discursive space that eventually leads to a possibility of vindicating rights, which is well illustrated in the African system through the claims of indigenous peoples. But I suppose the point I was making is that there are collective rights, which includes the idea of indigenous peoples rights in the African Charter. The second um, distinguishing feature of the African Charter is that it not only provides for individual rights, but also for individual duties. And I think that is much more controversial, and I, and I, and I don't want to go too far with this, because I think the intention of the drafters was really only to um, underline, in a sense, the moral morality of seeing the individual as someone embedded in community, and under, under, uh, to underscore the, the reciprocity of rights and obligations, and uh, the idea of a communitarian existence that was underlined. Now, if one looks at it from a strictly legal point of view, having individual obligations in a human rights treaty seems potentially uh, allowing the potential for abuse or for trumping <coughs> of rights. But suffice it to say that the Commission has not used um, those individual obligations in that way. They have merely um, given it uh, a positive uh, interpretation, asking the states uh, during their periodic reports to report about how they, the states, are actually providing a, an environment conducive to the positive uh, prospering, if you like, of, of these individual obligations. So you, you might then understand that the African Commission, different from the Inter-American Commission, and the European Commission, when it existed, actually has a periodic reporting obligation uh, or examination as well. In other words, similar to the UN treaty bodies, states report every two, four years, and in these reports, they will say how are they actually 
fostering the positive content to individual obligations now. For example, there's one obligation to, um, for example, work towards the um, uh, improvement of the uh, well-being of society by putting your own intellectual and other capacities at the service of society. And this has been understood to lead to an obligation on states to tell the Commission what is it doing to ensure, among other things, that community service, forms of community service, are in place in a particular state. So the Commission has not been um, uh, specific about the kinds of community service, but some form of community service seems to be what these rights or what these individual obligations imply. One could add to the African Charter's peculiar characteristics the right to development. It is really the first international instrument, again, that has uh, justiciable in its treaty provisions the right to development. And in the very same case, against Kenya, um, the right to development of indigenous people, the community there, was also asserted and was found to have been violated. And I think, you know, one of the things we often ask ourselves is what does the right to development add to merely having a number of socio-economic rights protected? But this case, I think, illustrates very well that the point that uh, the Commission makes in this case is that the um, right to development is not only a right about substantive outcomes, but it is also a right about process of getting to the outcomes. And it was really the lack of consultation by the government in the process of evicting people in the name of development that caused the violation of the right to development in the case that I referred to. Um, the last aspect that I'll mention here as a peculiarity of the African human rights system is the indivisibility of human rights um, in the sense that both so-called civil and political rights, the right to vote, the right to uh, freedom of expression, the freedom of uh, 